Hi, I'm David Logan. I'm the dean here at the Roger Williams Law School. Thank you for coming out to the fifth Thurgood Marshall Memorial Lecture. Um, we have had a, a, some wonderful opportunities through this lecture to meet some of the leading thinkers and, and doers in the legal profession over the years. And the person I'm going to introduce momentarily uh, adds even more to this wonderful tradition. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dean Minow, I want to take a moment to thank Hinckley, Adam Snyder, and the lawyers from the firm. Um, uh, just very quickly, when I arrived here, one of the partners of the firm um, ran into me at the, at the Rhode Island Bar Association annual meeting. I didn't know a soul here. Um, I'm not from around here. Uh, and uh, struck up a conversation. And among the things he said was, is there anything the firm can do to help the law school uh, get ahead? And I thought about it. That's a question you should never ask a dean. Uh, <laughs> there, the answers are many. Um, but uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to, to, uh, to cement our commitment to this lecture series. We had had one at that point, and um, for a host of reasons, uh, not least the importance of Justice Marshall's legacy to the legal profession, uh, I wanted to have an endowment for it, to be able to bring the best speakers in America uh, to campus uh, to speak to our community. And so thank you, Hinckley, Allen, and Snyder. Uh, it's a firm with which we have many close relationships. As recently as last May, Bob Flanders from your firm got an honorary degree here. Adam Ramos, um, wonderful associates, uh, partners of counsel, um, worth really close to the law firm. We thank you very much for your support for this important initiative. Uh, Martha Minow has been uh, dean at Harvard uh, and a faculty member at Harvard um, for a number of years. And in that time, she has left her mark on legal education, uh, on her students, uh, and on the, the larger American community. Uh, one example of her outreach is she is, uh, is this the correct title, president of legal services? Vice chair. Vice chair of the Legal Services Corporation, one of the most important institutions in any community, and certainly in Rhode Island, uh, and certainly at this difficult economic time, Rhode Island Legal Services and the work they do is absolutely essential. Uh, Martha has written broadly on a range of topics with sort of equality and fairness sort of as the, the theme of her work. Um, she has uh, helped teach a generation of, of lawyers who have gone out themselves to change the world, and it is that spirit that understanding that law can be a positive tool and that young lawyers, middle-aged lawyers and old lawyers can be social architects and make America a better place that comes closer to the dreams set up both in the Declaration of Independence and also in the very life and the work of Thurgood Marshall. Um, Dean Minow clerked for Justice Marshall and I hope either in her direct comments or in questions later we'll have a chance to speak with her about his specific legacy. I give you my dear friend, Martha Minow. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, David. That is really uh, lovely. Uh, and I also thank uh, Hinckley, Allen, and Snyder. And I thank the president for being here. And I thank you all for being here. And now I'm going to bait and switch. So I'm not going to talk about what I said I was going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about pursuing justice in multicultural societies, though anybody starts to jump up and down midway through my talk, I'll switch. And I'll do that instead. But uh, as I was getting ready to come, I started thinking about Trayvon. Uh, and I started thinking about the Supreme Court granting review in the Fisher case, the uh, affirmative action case coming out of Texas. And I started thinking about this moment in this country and decided I have to talk about race. So I'm going to do that. Um, and I am also going to talk about Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, I wrote a book that came out a couple years ago about that, but I was dean when the book came out. I didn't have a chance to really finish it. So I'm still thinking about the book. Um, and uh, as I do so, and I really am very honored to be here, it's a delight to be here at this school. It's, it's a terrific honor to be in a series uh, that honors my former boss, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall. Um, I was his clerk. Um, I was um, interviewed at a time when I had a terrible cold. I mean, you know, one of those colds where nothing comes out of your mouth, you can't even, like, get a sound. And so I was called up, and, and, and they said, come for an interview. And I said, I can't talk. Can I, can I reschedule? 
There's this long pause on the other end of the phone from other clerks saying, you don't reschedule with Justice Thurgood Marshall. So I came with my Kleenex under one arm. Seriously, I mean, I was a mess. And he kind of looked at me and went, whoa. And he says, my daddy had a cure for what you had. You take quinine and whiskey. <laughs> and then he says, and then you leave out the quinine. <laughs> And I thought, we're going to get along just fine. He offered me the job, and I think he wanted me out of the office before I sneezed on him. <laughs> I had a, an extraordinary experience working uh, with him, and I'd be glad to talk with you uh, ab about that. I wish I had taken notes on his stories. His stories were the best of all. And maybe by the end of my time here, I'll tell you a couple of them. I do want to talk about the case that really is probably uh, most synonymous with his work. You know, he's maybe one of the only Supreme Court justices who is as well known, if not more so, for the work he did before he went on the court than the work he did on the court. Um, and he was a brilliant litigator. He was a brilliant persuader. He convinced people to be willing to be plaintiffs at a time when their lives were at stake. Seriously, the physical violence that they'd face if they stood up and wanted to challenge the Jim Crow practices in this country. And he just had a way of doing it. Maybe it was that whiskey, but he definitely had a way of, of persuading people to be courageous and be brave. One of the things that surprised me when I started clerking for him was that some of his most uh, proud possessions pertained to the work that he had done outside the country. And I hadn't known anything about that. So in particular in Africa, in particular in Kenya, during the period when it was becoming an independent nation, he helped the founders really craft the Constitution. And it was something he was very, very proud of. And so I'm going to talk about a global perspective on Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and controversial as the case was when it was decided, it has now been understood in this country and it turns out around the world to be the touchstone for what a court can do when it acts with justice. And I want to talk about how did that come to pass. As other scholars have come, begun to explore, the Brown case itself was a product in part of global politics inside the United States, Cold War politics. And it certainly has had a legacy uh, in the world that I think is not well known. So inside the United States, there's a cottage industry of academic uh, scholars who study the influence of Brown. And within this country, the impact, I believe, uh, is, reaches well beyond racial desegregation in schools. Indeed, it probably, in my view, it's had more success outside of schools than inside of schools. Um, and why do I say that? I say that because the regime of legally mandated segregation that persisted in uh, many parts of this country um, well through the 1950s uh, ended. And it ended uh, not with one decision, but Brown was the turning of the tide. And that regime included laws that specified that books that were used by black children could not be stored in the same place as books that were used by white children. That blacks and whites could not play cards together. Uh, the kind of uh, rigid uh, rules about social relationships that the very fact you had to specify those kinds of rules indicated this was unnatural. People actually wanted to socialize. People actually wanted to connect with each other. Um, you think about the fact that Loving versus Virginia, the law, the case striking down uh, the rules uh, in Virginia, and at that time, 18 other states forbidding uh, marriage between people of different races, that wasn't decided until 1967. Now, that may seem like a long time ago to some of you in this room. Some of us, that's not that so long ago. Um, so I do argue in a book that I did publish that Brown may have had more influence on racial justice outside the context of schooling uh, more influence in schooling, actually, outside the context of racial integration, uh, with impact on the treatment of gender, the treatment of disability, the treatment of language, where schools now, just uh, all across the country, the question is, how do we assure equality for people regardless of their characteristics? That was not true before. Um, Brown's rejection of separate but equal spurred the end of segregation in retail stores and theaters, swimming pools, employment, but, of course, only after struggle. Uh, not only the court cases, but also legislation and people taking to the streets. Uh, 
The impact in other areas uh, has taken me even to places like Hawaii to look at the treatment of Native Hawaiians in schools. Um, the uh, impact on the treatment of religion in schools, the treatment on economic class. So all of those are very interesting and I'm glad to talk about that. But if you talk about Brown's influence in the world, I think there are some surprises. Some of you may recall that Brown's famous footnote 11 cites social science research. One of the pieces of research in that famous footnote was by Swedish economist Gunnar Myrdal, whose work was commissioned in 1944 by the Carnegie Corporation, which turned not by accident to a distinguished non-American for an unbiased view about American race relations. And the result was a searing indictment of the American treatment of, quote, the Negro. Um, when the United States tried to position itself after the end of World War II as a leader in human rights and a supporter of the United Nations, President Eisenhower's Republican administration pressed for ending official segregation and the terror of lynching and cross burnings and seeking to elevate America's image in the fight between the United States and the Soviet Union over the Third World, the State Department and the Department of Justice convinced President Eisenhower that the administration had to support the desegregation effort in its struggle before the United States Supreme Court. In the brief that w the, was submitted on behalf of the United States government, the Attorney General told the court, and I quote, the existence of discrimination against minority groups in the United States has an adverse effect upon our relations with other countries. Racial discrimination furnishes grist for the communist propaganda mills, and it raises doubt even among friendly nations as to the intensity of our devotion to the democratic faith. So Brown itself has to be understood as the coming of awareness in this country that we're in a global context, and the shame that this country actually experienced when the world looked at how we treated uh, people in our own country. African-American civil rights leader and journalist Roger Wilkins later recalled that ending official segregation became an urgent matter when the official, uh, uh, officials who were greeting black ambassadors coming to Washington, D.C. and to the United Nations uh, would actually tell the black ambassadors with some embarrassment, you can't go here, you can't go here, you can't go here. That was America in the 1950s and the early 60s. When uh, Thurgood Marshall came to argue Brown versus Board of Education at the Supreme Court, there was no place he could eat in Washington, D.C. except the train station. After the decision, Brown had striking reverberations outside the United States. The movement for international human rights took up the condemnation of racially, seg racially based segregation quite explicitly. This resulted ultimately in the enactment of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. It was adopted by the United Nations National Assembly in 1965, and a sufficient number of nations had endorsed it for it to take force by 1969. That number of nations did not include the United States of America. The United States of America did not ratify this convention until 1994 due to opposition from Southern senators. The impact of Brown continues to this day outside the United States. In 1995, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Israel cited Brown in rejecting the refusal by Israel's land administration to grant Arabs the right to build homes, uh, and which Arabs had deemed separate but equal, uh, uh, unacceptable separate but equal treatment, and the court agreed. Advocates pursuing equal opportunity and social change in Northern Ireland, in South Africa, in Eastern Europe have used Brown as a touchstone explicitly in their own struggles. The case and the struggle behind it have served as a, an evocative reference point in many nations for initiatives addressing social hierarchy and exclusion having nothing to do with race whatsoever. And so it echoes in efforts to uh, tackle divided educational systems based on religion uh, or excluding girls uh, from the same opportunity for boys or students with disabilities um, from the opportunities given to others. Uh, and so that's the kind of impact that I think is surprising but terribly important. And yet, from the perspective of other nations, the decision in Brown is notable not only as a symbol, but also as a challenge, as a warning about the limitations uh, and the problems, the gaps that have emerged with Brown. And so in this sense, like the critique of the United States that led the State Department to urge uh, the end of the Jim Crow practices in schooling, I'm going to talk about Brown and its limits by thinking about how it looks from a global perspective, and in particular, how the implementation looks. <laughs>
And there are really four elements that I think are worthy of our reflection at this moment. From a global perspective, Brown represents an equality norm that requires proof of intentional discrimination, which means that it does not address de facto segregation or racial hierarchy that lacks easy proof of the specific discriminatory intent by individuals. That is out of step with the treatment of discrimination in other parts of the world. Secondly, intersectional or plural forms of difference and discrimination are complicated and they require more conceptual, legal, or political resources than were mustered in Brown. Third, the risks of backlash against and resistance to court-ordered social change include not only specific failures in the context of school desegregation in this country, but also potential jeopardy to respect for the rule of law. The amount of disrespect that Brown's enforcement regime has triggered actually, I think, raises real questions about how seriously we hold uh, uh, in high regard respect for the rule of law. And fourth, the regard given to group identities in some other societies is a stark contrast to the approach taken in Brown, but more importantly since Brown, that demands color blindness and indifference to group identity as the only way to understand equality. So I'm going to talk about each of these, but I hope in a more narrative form so it's not boring. We'll see. So South Africa is one nation where Brown has long inspired reforms. The apartheid regime that segregated students by race since 1905 deliberately excluded black South Africans from any real educational opportunities. Hendrik Fresh Vervoord, who was a senator and later prime minister, he helped shape the Bantu Education Act of 1953. Think about it, 1953 is when formal racial segregation hit South African schools. Uh, and the idea there was not just the schools, but all of the society, including housing, including uh, all kinds of details that are reminiscent in many ways of Jim Crow. Vervoord said at that time, there is no place for the African in the European community above the level of a certain form of labor. It is no avail for him to receive a training which has as its aim absorption in the European community. Education must train people in accordance with their opportunities in life according to the sphere in which they live. By the 1970s, under this regime, per capita spending in schools for black students was less than a tenth than the resources allocated to white students. In 1958, the Britain's Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, cited Brown in a speech critiquing apartheid in an address to the South African Parliament. In the 70s, two lawyers who worked closely with Thurgood Marshall on Brown versus Board of Education joined with lawyers in South Africa to develop judicial strategies to challenge apartheid. And after the fall of apartheid and the creation of the new constitutional regime, the South African Constitutional Court has repeatedly cited Brown versus Board of Education. Indeed, when I've had the privilege of talking with several members of the Constitutional Court there, they all say Brown is a touchstone, Brown is an inspiration for them. And by that, they mean the decision and they mean the social movement behind it. Just an example, uh, one of the cases is in Ray, the School Education Bill of 1995. The court relied on Brown in discussing the important role of education in developing and maintaining a democratic society. Uh, yet, the, it also reflected the history of South Africa and the global human rights movement in rejecting the claim that in that case, that the government had a duty to establish or fund Afrikan schools while recognizing the right of private groups to maintain their schools. So the struggle to translate what, what the principles of Brown mean in that context uh, has continued and it actually, in, in an interesting way, led the Constitutional Court in South Africa to look behind labels, look behind labels and actually look at the social hierarchy. Um, one author argues that the tensions in this country over school desegregation and affirmative action explicitly influenced the drafters of the South African Constitution in their decision to shield remedial uses of racial categories from constitutional challenges. So the Constitution for South Africa allows affirmative action. It does not subject it to heightened scrutiny. And this was done explicitly by people who looked at what happened in the United States and said, we don't want to go there. Outside the context of schools and racial discrimination, the South African Constitutional Court has pointed to Brown to illustrate judicial power to issue injunctive relief. And this occurred in perhaps 
one of the most important decisions of this new court, the landmark decision that rejected as a violation of the constitutional right to health the failure of the government to distribute the drug nevirapine to HIV positive pregnant women. And that decision, you can't imagine happening in our court, right? It's a right to health, a right to health care under the Constitution, and for that, the court cited Brown. In Northern Ireland, Brown has been a touchstone for reform in recent years. Education in Northern Ireland has long divided, uh, been divided between what are called controlled schools, which are run by the government and have roots in Protestantism, serve about 50% of the students, and what are called managed schools, which are maintained by Catholic organizations and educate most of the other children. Now, historically, these two separate school systems each taught different versions of the history of the region, as well as different uh, religious uh, teachings. And the schools, therefore, themselves contributed to the tensions and the violence in Northern Ireland during the period called the Troubles um, from the 1960s, continuing actually long after the Belfast Agreement of 1998. A group of parents started the Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education as a voluntary organization to develop schools that bring together students from the two communities. Ultimately seeking government support, this movement um, has grown and it allows parents to launch new integrated schools if they can find enough families that are interested. What's most interesting to me, they now have wait lists. It's a really different history. They made integrated education a scarce good and now they have wait lists. By 2009, the integrated education movement, which has aids from the English Charitable Trust, had produced 19 integrated nursery schools, 40 integrated primary schools, 20 integrated secondary schools, reaching barely 5% of the population. Let's not kid ourselves, this is a small uh, initiative, but it has actually produced a desire uh, that is striking in the community for this possibility. Um, for the possibility of integrated schools. And what's my evidence for that is the uh, public opinion polls, which actually show that 82% of those polled report that they personally support the idea of integrated schooling. 55% of parents say the only reason their kids do not attend an integrated school is because they cannot get into one. Really different history uh, than the one we've had. Northern Ireland experienced a spike of intergroup violence in March of 2009 after the murder of a Northern Irish police officer and then murders of two British soldiers, a resurgence of a kind of terror tactics uh, by dissident groups that had previously racked the whole region. And a local journalist warned that the peace process had only occurred at the top of the society among politicians and it didn't touch the roots of the community. And so he wrote in a Northern Irish newspaper, Northern Ireland needs its own version of Brown versus Board of Education. Brown resonates around the world. How about Eastern Europe? In Eastern Europe, there's a group of uh, people called the Roma, who are the largest, poorest minority group uh, across that part of the world, and they are subject to various forms of social and political exclusion. One survey of social attitudes in three European countries found that 78% of those who were surveyed had negative views of the Roma. Who are the Roma? They have roots traced to northern India. Their local languages are mixtures of Sanskrit and European languages. They are sometimes called gypsies. They have centuries of semi-nomadic living in tribes and clams, clans. Many uh, have lived in the margins of European uh, communities for uh, decades, if not centuries. And their members have very low levels of employment, very little formal education. After the end of communism, with the increasing integration of Europe, a clash has really broken out between the marginalized Roma individuals and the European community's ostensible commitments to equality and to the free movement of people. And that has accelerated uh, not only in Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe as well. The Roma communities are typically impoverished, not only financially, but also they're treated as others who cannot be assimilated. And some people blame them uh, and say that they're dirty or they are thieving or what, what have you. But it's so interesting to see how politics plays out, because when Eastern European countries have applied for membership in the European Union, the European Union has said, look at how you treat the Roma. You can't 
join us unless you figure that out. At the same time, Ro Roma immigrants have fled to Western Europe, and there it's not like they've been welcoming either. Um, so it's a, been an interesting and challenging uh, time, and it involves language and ethnicity and poverty and segregation. Enter the Open Society Institute, um, a product of uh, an immigrant to the United States who made a lot of money in arbitrage. Uh, he ran, uh, he, he actually uh, funded the Roma Participation Program and to support uh, grassroots reforms and others and the European Roma Rights Center in Budapest, Hungary, and they joined together to challenge the exclusion of Roma students from schools in the Czech Republic. And the advocates working on behalf of the Roma students, guess what? Look to Brown versus Board of Education quite explicitly. They look to the case itself, they look to the movement surrounding it to launch what has become known as the DH case. Litigation launched in 1999, became the centerpiece of the Roma rights movement, styled as a complaint on behalf of 18 students. The case focused on systemic discrimination and mindsets perpetuating second class status for an entire group of people. The Constitutional Court of the Czech Republic dismissed the suit. The lawyers filed a new complaint with similar allegations before the European Court of Human Rights and alleged violations of the guarantee of the European Convention of Human Rights that specifically call for freedom from racial discrimination in schooling. But here, Brown's own framework proved insufficient because it requires proof of intentional segregation. The government in the Czech Republic said there's no intentional discrimination here. The Roma students go to special schools because they take a test. And the test determines whether or not they have disabilities. And it turns out most of them do. Now the fact that the test was given in Czech might have been part of the problem, since most of the Roma don't speak Czech. But even under US law, that would be treated most likely as an expression of impact as opposed to intentional discrimination. And so the allegation that was developed uh, in the European court argued that there's indirect discrimination here. It depends on the placement practices that has a disproportionate and negative impact on the Roma community. And it, therefore, it relied on statistical evidence. Studies showed that a Roma child was 27 times more likely to be placed in the special schools than were other children. Roma students compose between 50 and 70% of the students in the special schools. They make up about 2% of the population. This is the statistical case that was presented. The complaint also argued that the special schools used an inferior curriculum. It prevented students from attending, who attended those schools from transferring back to the regular schools or ever getting a sufficient background to be able to go to a secondary school or go to a college. Before the European Court of Human Rights, the Ministry of Education of the Czech Republic defended its practices and said these are individualized assessments of each child's intellectual capacity. The complainants responded that the placement process used unreliable intelligence tests as well as the linguistic uh, problem that I identified. And in the year 2000, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance observed that Roma children were channeled into special schools in a quasi-automatic fashion and attributed their poor performance on placement tests in part to the fact that most Roma children don't even go to kindergarten. The second chamber, the European Court of Human Rights, rejected the claim. But on review, the Grand Chamber in 2007 ruled by a vote of 13 to 4 in favor of the Roma applicants. The Grand Chamber found that the special schools offered an often inferior curriculum, diminished educational and employment prospects, and that placement in the special schools likely increased the stigma for Roma children. The court emphasized that segregated education denies both the Roma and non-Roma children the chance to know each other and to learn to live as equal citizens. That's as close as I can find a resonance of Brown v. Board of Education because the case itself is not cited by the court. The court did note that the regular schools showed a reluctance to accept the Roma students, and it also acknowledged that the Roma parents often favored the channeling of their children to special schools, partly to avoid abuse from non-Roma children in the ordinary schools, or isolation from other neighborhood Roma children. But the Grand Chamber cited research, interestingly, from the United States about racial inequality in special education. 
This is one of those intersectional points, the overrepresentation of kids in color in special education in the United States became data in the European court about Roma. And the court relied centrally on a European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. But it also pointed to European community law and practice concerning indirect discrimination and disparate impact. And it relied, the only site from the United States uh, court system, it relied on the uh, United States Supreme Court's interpretation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which allows evidence of disparate racial impact as evidence of racial discrimination. It's just something that is allowed under our statutory system, but not under the Constitution. And frankly, that particular interpretation of the statute is in jeopardy. I'm not sure it will last uh, under the current Supreme Court. So the treatment of Roma children could not be approved uh, in the European court. Um, and that would be the punchline, and it's a nice rousing end, except it's not the end because as landmark a decision as this may be, and it is one of the landmark decisions of the European court, at the current moment, there's very little implementation. Sound familiar? In this respect, the decision looks awfully like the problems that we've had implementing Brown. Uh, in a report dated two years after the decision, the Czech government continued to describe educational underachievement of Roma students as the explanation for why they still remained in separate schools. The government renamed the special schools. They gave them new names. They called them practical primary schools, but they continue to have the same inferior curriculum. Surveys released by the Czech government and studies by non-governmental organizations indicate that Roma students remain much more likely than non-Roma students to still be placed in the separate schools. And uh, this problem of implement implementation uh, continues. Um, the court uh, itself offered very little guidance about how to tackle the implementation problem. Uh, and uh, the Open Society Institute and Roma uh, Rights Center issued a report just this past fall that said, to date, there is no evidence of any decrease in the disproportionately high numbers of Romani children being channeled illegally into segregated practical schools. And this is... Uh, four years after the decision, five years after the decision. So that's another sad legacy of Brown v. Board of Education. The DH case and others demonstrate backlash and resistance. The legal victory itself was secured only by moving beyond the requirement of proof of intentional discrimination, which is required in the United States. Similarly, the requirement of proof of intentional discrimination that we have in Brown has made Brown an irrelevant precedent in many parts of the world. Take, for example, Brazil. In Brazil, there are strong patterns of racial disparity in education, but they resist reform because, according to one commentator, and I quote, Brazilian race ideology equates segregation with the state-imposed context of the United States and South Africa. Because Brazil and the Czech Republic underscore intersectional forms of difference, in uh, the Czech Republic, it's uh, language and ethnicity and class. In Brazil, it's class and race. It's not clear that Brown provides the resources that are necessary to deal with the complexity. When race and economic class in particular converge, attacking differential treatment on the basis of one of these dimensions um, is not successful because the other dimension can be pointed to and a similar dynamic results when differences of ethnicity and language converge. These, in fact, are ongoing lessons of relevance to ongoing patterns of racial disparities in American schooling. A further set of lessons emerge from global perspectives. Unlike in the central legal focus on individual rights in the United States, in many other societies, group identities matter and deserve protection under law. Even when redressing historic exclusions and discrimination for purposes of equal respect and access to resources, protection for distinctive communities may, to some, be as or even more important than social integration. Assimilation, when it's forced or even chosen, can produce its own forms of degradation and deprivation. International legal resources express this concern. For example, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, promulgated a convention against discrimination in education, and it simultaneously rejects discrimination impairing equality of treatment on the basis of race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, economic condition or birth, 
prohibits discrimination on the basis of any of those individual markers. But at the same time, this human rights document calls for protection of separate educational systems or institutions on the basis of religion or language. Two different ideas about equality. What are the circumstances under which these separate educational institutions are justified? Where it's optional, where it reflects the wishes of the pupil's parents or legal guardians, where it conforms to official standards. But it's clearly an expression of the resistance to mistreatment of national minorities, which is as much an experience in Europe as is the experience of individuals facing discrimination. So protecting language, religion, cultural heritage is part of the commitment to equality as it has developed in the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe seeks to protect and promote traditional languages, and its European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages explicitly does so. Again, big contrast to the United States, the struggle over the English-only movement, for example. Equal treatment may thus focus on protecting individuals from being discriminated against on the basis of group traits, but it may instead call for equal treatment of individuals precisely because they are members of distinctive groups. Overcoming group-based discrimination could demand treating each child as a distinct individual who's entitled to social mobility, full inclusion, but it could instead summon respect for parents and groups of adults who wish to pass on their own traditions and voluntarily separate their children from others. That may even foreclose social mobility. Debates in the United States over school desegregation might look different if we came back with these global lenses. Justice Clarence Thomas has defended majority African-American schools in ways that mirror arguments from Muslim or Jewish schools in France or the Netherlands or even the Afrikaans school in South Africa. In one opinion, Justice Thomas argues, and I quote, it is far from apparent that coerced racial mixing has any educational benefits, much less that integration is necessary to black achievement. And he also emphasized that because of their distinctive histories and traditions, majority minority schools can function as a center and symbol of African American communities while offering children examples of independent black leadership and success. This is obviously controversial. Not everybody agrees with him. But it does suggest he's not alone. He's reflecting a viewpoint that actually has a real uh, uh, echo in European debates. Whether to integrate schools or preserve schools of distinctive linguistic or cultural groups is a profound challenge, even if everybody agrees that equality is the only operative goal. For nations with a history of genocide or civil war or intergroup violence, even the contemplation of school integration, bringing together members of different groups is fraught with risks. I've been involved in a project uh, bringing together people who live in what are called divided cities, cities are, that are subject to uh, the government of two different countries because of uh, civil war or other kinds of conflicts. Um, and so there, there are cities in, in, in Cyprus, there are cities in Northern Ireland, there are cities in Eastern Europe, uh, there are cities in the Middle East. And in a discussion uh, about some of these issues, I was really uh, struck when a government official replied when we were talking about integrating schools across racial and ethnic differences in Iraq, he said, we would go to war to stop that. In an experiment in integration, the first school in Bosnia that enrolls students who are Muslim Bosniaks and students who are Catholic Croats in the same school building, it's a big deal, um, actually gets a lot of press, but if you go visit this school, you go in the front door, and immediately students are sorted into their separate languages and their separate classrooms. They each, in fact, have a right to be taught in his or her own language, to learn his or her, her own history and religion. Uh, the gymnasium separates the students according to nationality. The only place they come together is for sports and extracurricular activities and in a science lab, which was paid for by a donor who said no one can use the science lab unless it's an integrated fashion. A global perspective might be a source for domestic critique. A global perspective can illuminate choices that we've made. It can suggest how we can learn from others. It can problematize the legacies of even as important a case as Brown versus Board of Education. Justice Thurgood Marshall's example as a champion of justice and equality led him to have a global perspective. 
Our own domestic pursuit of justice and our work in law schools, I think, should do the same. I'm going to say just, I'm going to tell you one story uh, about Thurgood Marshall, or actually one of his stories, uh, and then I'll end, and I really would love to have a conversation with you, or I can launch into my other's talk, whichever you want. Uh, so the story is this. Uh, Justice Marshall told a lot of jokes, and most of them I cannot repeat because they were <laughs> off color, but here's one of them. So in this joke, um, there's a man who loved to gamble, which actually the justice did too. He loved to gamble. And this man went to Las Vegas, and he lost all of his money. And um, when I say all of his money, I mean all of his money. And this is back in the day that if you wanted to go use a restroom, you needed, you needed money. You couldn't use the stall without money. So he's actually in the men's room kind of looking forlorn and pathetic because he doesn't even have enough money for a stall. So someone takes pity on him and gives him a quarter. So he turns to open up the stall, and lo and behold, the man coming out keeps the door open for him. So as he comes out of the men's room, what's he going to do, Justice Marshall would say. He has a quarter. What's he going to do? He goes to the craps table, and he wins big. And it wouldn't be a story if he didn't then go play poker. And he wins big. And he goes and he does the slots, and he wins big. He comes out, he's got a bundle of money. So he goes and he hires uh, an investment advisor, and he invests the money. And three years go by, and he makes a gazillion dollars. He's really very wealthy, and he's feeling kind of kind of grateful about that time back in Las Vegas. So he hires, he hires uh, a private detective. And he says, please find for me the, the, you know, my benefactor, the man who made this all possible. So a year goes by. And the private detective says, I haven't found anybody. And the guy says, you got to go find him. So another year goes by. And he comes back and he says, I found him. I found the man who gave you that quarter that day in the men's room in Las Vegas. And our hero says, I don't care about that man. I want the man who left the stall door open. <laughs> so, you know, this is one of those jokes. It's not that good a joke, but it's an okay joke. <laughs> it's an okay joke. What, what interested me is why, why did Justice Marshall like this joke so much? And I don't want to read too much into it. He did like to gamble a lot. But I actually think this joke mattered to him because he believed in the opportunities of doors that are open. He didn't believe in handouts, and that's why he liked this joke. So I like this joke, too. Uh, I have had a lot of privileges in my life. Working for him was absolutely right up there. Another, though, I will say, was sitting in the White House watching President Barack Obama, my former student, nominate to the United States Supreme Court, Elena Kagan, my former student, and, and Thurgood Marshall's former clerk to the United States Supreme Court. And I think that Justice Marshall would look at that moment as a great moment in American history. So my my, I'm really interested in your comments, your thoughts, uh, or else I'll launch into another speech, I promise. <laughs> Sure, good question. Problems from Brown that are unsolved going forward. Well, uh, some I think I may have implied already. One is the total failure to actually implement Brown. I mean, what's interesting is the story, and I do try to explore this in my book, is one of resistance to the actual Brown decision for about 15 years, but then enforcement that starts during the administration of President Richard Nixon. And between 1969, 1970, 1971, there actually is pretty emphatic enforcement. And by 1972, the most racially integrated schools in the country are in the South. But then there's a backlash in the country. And the backlash is, uh, includes actually Richard Nixon as he starts to appoint people to the court who have different views. Uh, and by the time of the case of Milliken versus Bradley, uh, when the court actually decides that the remedial uh, strategies dealing with demonstrated intentional integration stop at the border of the school system in which the in intentional discrimination was found, that is really the beginning of the end. Uh, and it uh, really gave a spur to white flight to the suburbs, and all the numbers change after that time. So um, at, at the 50th anniversary of Brown uh, in 2004, the Harvard Civil Rights Project reported that schools are more racially separated by that time than they were at the time of Brown. 
Now, it's, you know, that people can fight about the methodology, but it's clearly the case that if you are a student of color in this country, your chances of going to integrated school are not very good. Uh, if you're a white student in this country, um, you're likely to live growing up um, in a, a community that's a suburb or a community that's under 100,000 people. Communities of 100,000 people in this country are mostly white. They're mostly separated. Mostly, they're not they're not legally segregated, but they're separated. So that's a big question. It's a big problem. That if you think that the actual mixing of people together in society is an important way to assure that the opportunities are equal, or an important way for people to actually overcome the impression that someone unlike themselves is really other, we're not doing it. We're not doing it here. We, to the extent that we're doing it, we're doing it in the workplace. Workplaces are much more integrated than our schools. Um, and that's one reason why I'm so concerned about the uh, efforts to roll back affirmative action uh, in, in places of higher education, um, because I think that that spells uh, really trouble for what has been an important uh, development. You know, when the Supreme Court decided the Grutter case approving the use of race in the selection of students for, to the University of Michigan Law School, it was very influenced by the briefs brought by, uh, on behalf of the military and on behalf of the Fortune 500 companies, which said that racial integration is key to this country's success. It's key to the strength of the military. And as I'm in conversations now about the Fisher case, which is coming out at the University of uh, Texas, we're not sure that, that kind, those kind of briefs are going to matter to anybody on the court right now. Um, so that's a big question. Other questions, you know, impact of Brown um, uh, outside of um, schools, big, big question. Prisons, you know, you've got to talk about prisons, criminal justice system. Sure. Well, first let me say a couple of words about Justice Marshall on the court. You know, I think he was one of the most qualified people to ever sit on the court. You know, not only had he been Solicitor General, not only had he been uh, an appellate uh, judge, he had led one of the most successful uh, campaigns for litigation in the court in its history, maybe the most successful. And he was just a superb lawyer. But here's another feature that people tend not to talk about. He was one of the very few people ever to sit uh, on that court who practiced across the whole range of cases that come before the court. He did death penalty cases. He did criminal law cases. He did commercial cases. Uh, he, was, he knew about birth control and, and abortion. He, he had worked in labor cases. He, he just saw the range of America um, from his work as a lawyer. And uh, we haven't had many people on the court who had that experience. Um, and on the empathy point, I'll just tell you uh, one story uh, at my own expense. So there was, uh, pending the year I was clerking, a case that challenged conditions for people with mental retardation in state institutions, a subject that I have cared about a lot. So I wrote a typically bleeding heart kind of memo to him. And he threw it back on my desk and said, this is bleeding heart nonsense, and it will persuade no one, including me. Uh, he then did proceed to write a separate opinion that was in my direction, so I was glad to hear that. But he was a tough, tough uh, judge of, is there a legal argument? And pick your battles, and you don't bleed over every case. And, you know, there, and you know, another example I'd give you is there was a case um, that uh, dealt with a badly uh, drafted complaint. And, you know, I and my cold clerk said, yeah, but but for the badly drafted complaint, he would have a really good case. And he said, I'm sorry, we're not going to bend the rules here. If we bend the rules here, then I've got to be here when we need them. So he really was a lawyer, law, lawyer's lawyer, much more than the other judge I clerked for. The other judge I clerked for was Judge David Bazelon in the Court of Appeals, uh, just in Columbia Circuit. You know, the law? What was the law? You know, it was kind of like, well, let's, we'll figure out a way to make it, you know, happen. That was not, it was a big, uh, rude awakening when I got to the Supreme Court that actually the law mattered. Uh, you had to find cases, you had to read the statutes. It was a very different experience. Uh, 
That said, you know, I did sit down one day, I guess it took a couple of weeks, I read every single one of Justice Marshall's dissents. And I just kept track of all the different kinds of people for whom he showed empathy. And it's an extraordinary array. Old people, poor people, people with long hair, people with disabilities. And he, in opinion after opinion, he'd say, you got to look at it from their point of view. You got to figure out, this may not look like a lot of money to you, but to these people, this was a lot of money over and over and over again. So his capacity to identify with a whole range of people, again, I think it relates to just his, his character and his own life experience, but it was extraordinary. And it was true in the stories that he would tell. He would tell stories in which he would play all the parts in the story. You know, if there was a snake in the story, he'd be the snake. He could play, you know, he was just a magnificent storyteller. And I think that that capacity uh, informed his opinions. And you're right, just as O'Connor talked about learning something from him in that regard. When, just, when President Obama said that he wanted to appoint um, people to the bench who had, had empathy, he was immediately uh, trashed. Um, and, and actually, I was you know, working as an advisor to him during the campaign on the issue of judicial selections, and we had debates about how to describe what he should do or not do. Uh, it then turned out that when he nominated my friend and classmate, um, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, um, she got in trouble because she'd written this article about the wise Latina. Well, if you read the wise Latina article, she cites me uh, for the notion that you need judges who have empathy. So I thought I better get out of this whole discussion here. Uh, you know, I, I do think if I were to select a criteria, a criterion for appointing judges besides you know, their integrity and their intelligence, it would be have they suffered in life? Can they, can they understand? Can they put themselves in the position of someone who's in a difficult position? I, I have a friend who's a, who's a federal court judge, and uh, he was um, in a canoe uh, and uh, paddling down the, down the river without any ID. Because who brings their ID when you're in a canoe, right? And he got pulled over by some representative of the government who didn't believe he was a federal judge. He was put in jail. This is the best thing that ever happened to him, honestly. You know, and he would say so. He would say that it really gave him a window onto what he was judging every day. It's kind of like, you know, my brother-in-law who's a doctor. And when he was hospitalized, it really changed the way that he, he treats patients. So I, I think that that can be a good experience. No offense to any of the federal judges in the audience. Yep. <laughs> Hi. Sure, great, great question. I can tell you that he was really surprised that the world did not change the day after Brown. You know, and he, he was not happy that there was a scheduled re-argument for a year later to talk about the remedy, but he thought, okay, so then we'll do that, we'll get the remedy, it'll be implemented. Um, and it was a kind of shock to him. Uh, not that there was resistance, he, you know, he had to, really struggle for his own physical safety when he went to the South to find uh, clients and so forth, but that there was not a vigorous enforcement. He was very, very surprised. He also um, you know, felt very strongly that the resort to the courts was the right thing to do. He was frankly very critical of Malcolm X. He would talk, you know, really trash talk about Malcolm X. You know, and, and said, you, you, this is the greatest country in the world because we have a court system that you can go to and you can complain to. So he believed in it. Um, but of course, it was extremely disillusioning. I think that he uh, also came to believe that uh, there's an interaction between the courts and society. He was very involved in advocating you know, rights for women. He was an outstanding advocate for women. He was one of the only justices who ever hired women clerks. You know, when I was there, there were no women clerks. 
Um, and he, every year, had a woman clerk. Um, his very dear friend, Justice uh, Brennan, never had a woman clerk until the very end of his life. So, but, but I think on that, frankly, the court was behind the society. And I think he understood that um, sometimes the society leads in other ways. So I, I'm thinking about other areas where he thought about social change and social movements. You know, I think he certainly believed in legislation as well. Um, that's another form of law. He was just very skeptical about avenues that went outside um, the formal channels. Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow. Jim Crow. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's awkward, and I don't have any great insight into what he would say about something right now today, but he was uh, always concerned about uh, the conditions in prisons. I remember when I was clerking, we had a case that dealt with overcrowding in prisons, and uh, the, the lawyer defending the state said, you know, but there's room, even though these cells were only built for two people, there's room. We, we've, we found a way to put the, the beds in there. And he said, well, how big are these people? And he looked at me and says, if they're her size, maybe that's okay. Otherwise, it's not. So, I mean, you know, he, so he was concerned about prisons. Um, I think, you know, the, Michelle Alexander's book, I, I'm not an expert in prisons, but uh, she is not the first who's documented, you know, the just, again, vast disproportionate effect of our criminal justice system on people of color. Um, the you know, more statistics of one out of three or one out of four African American men are involved in the criminal justice system. You got to wonder, and I guess the issue that I was raising about the requirement of intentional discrimination to be able to show that there is an equal protection violation—that's a problem here, because if we go back to just even the uh, the, the Supreme Court's treatment of disparate impact evidence in the context of the death penalty. The court has said, if you can't show intent, it's not a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. So as long as that's the situation, the Constitution is not going to be particularly helpful. On the other hand, you know, I think about the fight about the um, differential sanctions for uh, powder cocaine versus crack cocaine. You know, you, you, can, you can have a fight in court, it can lose. You can then have a legislative fight. It's elevated people's attention to it. Um, and in that context, the demonstration that there really were differential racial effects of these different sentences, um, that, that affected Congress. Um, so I, I guess I think that the use of the different tools uh, is absolutely essential here. Um, I, I actually have some hope that the financial crisis will actually put the um, uh, incarceration rates in some kind of perspective. Um, I know that in some states, you know, having balanced budget amendments, it requires people to figure out what you're going to cut. If the one thing you can't cut is the prison budget and you're cutting everything else, that's, that may change the politics a little bit. Sure. How those deal with both, you know, um, the quality of education and also, you know, integration and the, the connection between the two. Um, the second slightly different one is back to your conversation dealing with the Roma. Um, and I had, I had the luck of taking a civil rights class from Jack Greenberg. Um, so this was, you know, back in 2002, and he'd already spent some time. Absolutely. Roma, right. Um, and did, you know, and I had conversations with him after that, too. And he always pointed to it as this sort of great example of how one could go about desegregation. 
But, you know, I've also spent some time in the yard and seen mm. how the room where it's yeah. they are. So I guess my question is, why do you, mm. why do you think there's sort of the disconnect between his original imagining of it and what's kind of gone in the years since then? All right. Um, well, let's, let me do them in reverse order. So um, I think, you know, Jack Greenberg was one of those great pioneer lawyers at the time of Brown that continued the global uh, application of some of these ideas. And he, he was not wrong to be optimistic. He convinced the highest court in Europe to tell the Czech Republic they had to change their school system. That's pretty great. There was no precedent like that. There was no knowledge, in fact, that there would be any kind of case like that that could succeed. And indeed, the lower chamber had rejected it. So, you know, I think that he was right to be optimistic. I think that he underestimated the difficulties of implementation the same way that Thurgood Marshall underestimated the difficulties of implementation. As your first question, the adequacy suits, you know, are the third wave of uh, school reform uh, initiatives dealing with finance. It's a fascinating saga, right? The Supreme Court rejects the case that was built following Brown that says discrimination on the basis of socioeconomic status is also a violation of legal protection. And paradoxically, that turns out to be a great resource today because it's now possible for school systems to use socioeconomic status to assign students to schools. It doesn't raise any kind of heightened scrutiny. So Cambridge, Massachusetts, Berkeley, California, initially it's just college towns. Now it's about 89 uh, cities that assign students on the basis of socioeconomic status. So that's a kind of silver lining. Meantime, the action goes to the state courts. Most states have something in their state constitutions that calls for a right to education. Sometimes it's a thorough education. Sometimes it's a thorough and efficient education. Figuring out what those words mean has been a lot of fun and interesting. Um, and uh, the, the development of some pretty interesting uh, jurisprudence about what are the elements of a quality education? You know, from the Kentucky case, uh, the Rose case on, you know, New Jersey, New York, we can go, uh, it, it's, it's at least half the states have had such a case and about 40% of the states have some kind of a remedy that's issued. But, you know, many of these are disappointing too in their implementation. Massachusetts is a good example. Massachusetts has a great opinion but the court says, but we see there's a legislative initiative coming down the road, so we're going to suspend any kind of implementation. Several years go by. Lawyers come back to court and say, hey, remember us? We still don't have improvement in the worst schools here. And the court says, sorry, we just can't figure out, we cannot figure out what to do. And I, I guess my, my own th lesson from that, uh, and it pertains to your question too, is that courts alone are not able to do the remedial part. Um, and that it requires putting together the social movement, a legislative initiative, frankly, a, the business community, making the business case for quality schools is absolutely critical. That was true in Kentucky. Um, it, it, courts are the least dangerous branch. They can't remake the society. They can hold out the norms, but if the society isn't gonna follow along, uh, it, it may actually hollow out the respect for the courts. Did you have a? That was, that was your question. Was looking at the same thing in terms of yeah. 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 Right. Well, I mean, I could talk about this for a long time. I mean, I do think that the commitment to schooling, uh, you know, is the civil rights challenge of our moment. It is the last entitlement program. This is it. It's the last entitlement program. And. Is there a minimum threshold of the quality of education? Some of these state cases give you language to say so. Um, it's in the interest of the whole society to make the schools better. Uh, I think it ought to be you know, a social movement for quality schools for everybody. I think that there's a danger of the privatization, not the fact of private schools, but the privatization of schooling, the idea that it's only your own kids that you care about, that other people's kids aren't of concern to you. That's, happened in the American rhetoric in a way that was not true in the 60s and in the 70s. And, uh, you know, we can try to unpack why that is, how that's come to pass, but I think we're, we're poorer for it. And unless we understand that all of our fates are tied up with the next generation, we're not going to really invest in the schools the way we should. I do think that we're on the brink of an amazing 
transformation of schooling because of the digital revolution. And I know people have been saying something like this since the 1950s, we're going to have computer instruction, and it never happened. But I have seen what some people are developing, and it is staggering. So that if you don't have the best teacher for math, you still could have access to the best teacher. And you could have access to individualized tests that reflect how you did on the last one. That even as you're answering your quiz questions in multiplication, it'll give you different questions based on what you got wrong. I think that if the same way that individualized medicine may be the frontier, we might have individualized education. And the question is, is this going to be another time for a big gap between the haves and the haves nots? Or is this going to be a, a, an opportunity to narrow that gap? And that's about social investment. It's a great question, and you know we are an outlier in the world in our insistence on local control of schools. Um, you know, in France, you can know what everybody is learning at the, when they're 10 years old at 10 o'clock because it's a centralized curriculum. I'm not saying that we want to go there, but we are on one extreme, they're on the other. You know, what I think is most uh, troubling is not local control of schools, but local control of financing of schools. So because the majority of American schools are financed by the property tax, that means that wealthier communities not only spend more per pupil, but they exert less effort. So you can be a poor community and have a much higher tax rate, and you won't generate the same level of per pupil expenditure that you would if you're a wealthy community. And the efforts to challenge that disparity has failed in federal court. It's some of those state court decisions have been more successful. Interestingly, Michigan and Hawaii now have rejected the reliance on local property tax. And I think that, you know, it shows it can be done. You can have a statewide tax system to generate revenues for schools, and you don't have a revolution. Um, I think that local control of schooling uh, can be very relevant when you're dealing with questions like bilingual education. You know, in the uh, uh, D.C. Uh, suburbs, uh, there's an enormous population of immigrants who are poor. And most of those parents don't want to have instruction in Vietnamese or Russian. And uh, to have the federal government tell them what, should do, what they should do doesn't seem right to me. On the other hand, I think the standards movement has really given a run for the money of local control of schools. You know, starting off, it was voluntary, then it was incentive. Now it's pretty mandatory, and these are federal standards. So uh, when you add to it the education uh, uh, monies tied to um, low-income students, the monies tied to special ed students, there is federal regulation in and around schools. There's state regulation in and around schools. We no longer um, are 100% local control of schools. And the tools are there. I think it's the political will that's not there. Yeah. So tell me what you, what you think about that. Sure. Uh -huh. Southwest. Yeah. You know, these kinds of disparities are true in every school district in the country. The, 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 the disparities within a state in per pupil expenditure are bigger than the disparities between states. So the gentrification, whether it's within public, uh, the, the public system or beyond, you know, one of the things that I just don't know what to do about is many public schools now have created private foundations that raise funds to supplement the resources available in the public school. If you have wealthy parents, 
they can do that. And so what, what, can, what, what can you do? You're going to ban that? That doesn't seem like a good idea. But it means that those students have access to resources that the other students don't. So th there's just a, a huge, huge problem here. But I don't think it's about leveling down. We want to level up. Um, and that's another interesting thing you get if you look globally. So in Canada, the idea of equality is interestingly and charmingly uh, accompanied by an adjective called substantive. Now, we call it substantive, they call it substantive. So substantive equality for them means you, you don't level down. So in this country, for example, you could have a challenge to maternity benefits on the grounds that it's discriminatory on the basis of gender. And the solution could be no benefits for anybody. In Canada, you can't do that. You have to provide paternity benefits too. And I think it'd be really interesting to develop that idea in the school context, that if you're going to have equalization, it's got to be up, not down. Sure, sure. Well, certainly as a dean, I deal with this question every single day. And, and at the Legal Services Corporation, you know, I deal with it all the time. Uh, frankly, the restrictions that Congress has placed on any entity that receives legal services money means that there's important work to be done, but it's not social change through uh, organizations that are funded by legal services organizations. You can't bring a class action, for example. You can't sue the federal government. I mean, there, there's kind of some limits. Um, <laughs> So I, here are a couple of things that I would say. One is um, I think it's just a mistake to create a white hat, black hat world of law. So you're only doing good if you're working in certain nonprofit organizations or you're working for the government or you have a salary that's below a certain amount. Uh, I have never been able to do a pro bono case of any significance without having the support of a private law firm actually underwrite what I'm doing or some partnership. Um, so I think that you can do an awful lot of good uh, in, in the private practice of law. I think that you can do a lot of good in government jobs. I also think that this generation understands better than I certainly did when I was in law school the power of two things. One, networks, and the other is entrepreneurship. So networks. I think that it is, um, to me, very inspiring. Look at Arab Spring. Arab Spring happened because for about three years, groups of students started using Facebook to organize protests. And there were students in Egypt who were in touch with students in Tunisia, and they literally were talking back and forth. You know, if we do this, will this work? If we use this logo, is that good? And, you know, they brought down a government. That was pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> And, and it was through, that was literally, you know, an internet network, but it also was this idea that y there's a force multiplier quality of working alongside other people. And, and the other idea is entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, it is a long-standing American tradition. If you don't have a job, you invent one. Um, and uh, it's also a long-standing tradition in law and social change. There weren't lawyers doing law and social change till some people invented it. The NAACP came out of something, a group of people from the Niagara movement who then created the idea there should be an organization and then they tried a whole lot of things and we look back on it as if they had a game plan. You know, they didn't really, they sort of did. Um, but schools is the one area where it succeeded. They tried to make similar changes in labor and they failed utterly. They tried to make similar changes in the criminal justice system with very little success. Um, and I have been very impressed by young people who start organizations or start um, uh, an ability even to support one of their members to do work while others are earning money or create a firm that's a combination of a public private law firm I didn't exist when I was in law school, but people who are financing public interest work by doing family law, by doing divorces, or public interest work by 
you know, doing special ed cases where there is attorney's fees, you know, figuring out the mix. It's very impressive to me, um, and it can be done, and it can be done on behalf of plaintiffs. It can be done uh, uh, not even in a litigative context, and it can be done not even necessarily using the same roadmap that people did in the past. So um, I heard recently from a, one of the very, very big private equity people who does the kind of work that I don't understand at all, okay, and it's, you know, very complicated economic transactions, and he was speaking to some of my students who were saying, how can I get a job doing what you do? And his answer was, I would not want it to get a job today doing what I do. When I started it, it was only me. Now I have an organization with 400 people. What you want to do is go someplace where nobody's been before. And I thought that was awfully good advice, very interesting advice. Thank you.